Hello everyone. In this very pleasant morning, I am Partha from the Biomics team would like to welcome you all for today's talk. The speaker of today's talk is Dr. Albert G. Nassibudin, Professor, Russian Academy of Sciences, Professor, Solko Institute of Science and Technology in Russia. He will be delivering his talk on carbon, nanotechno carbon nanotubes. On behalf of the bio Biomics team, I would like to welcome our eminent resource person, Dr. Albert G. Nassibudin. At this initial, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Halbert G. Nasuddin for accepting my invitation and taking the time out of his busy schedule to join with us. It's highly pride for our Biomix team in hosting this webinar with the eminent resource person. And I also appreciate and welcome all the participants internationally across the world who joined with us for this talk. Dear participants, we have question and answer sessions at the end of this presentation. You are supposed to place your questions in the chat box. Myself here to put your queries to our guest speaker during question and answer session. And also you can place your feedbacks as comments in the same chat box. Before we start the session, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Halbert G. Nesplin. Dr. Halbert G. Nesplin is a full-time professor at Solco in Institute of Science and Technology in Moscow in Russia. and heading the Laboratory of Nanometric Sciences at Halter University School of Chemical Engineering in Finland. He is serving as a CEO, Cryptochemistry Limited, spin-off from Sharkova Institute of Science and Technology, Moscow, Russia. He was an adjunct professor in the department. He was also a chief scientist consultant in Canada Limited, spin-off from LSK. University of Technology, Finland. He was a deputy manager of nanomaterials groups, senior research scientist in the Department of Applied Physics in Alta University School of Science in Finland. He was also served as Academy of Research Fellow in Academy of Finland and a senior research scientist at Aerosol Technology Group in VIT Chemical Technology in Finland. Dr. Dr. Albert G. Nesbri has pursued his Doctor of Science the highest scientific degree in Russia with specialization in powder, meteorology, and composite materials in St. Petersburg Chemical State University at Russia. He has completed his PhD in physical chemistry with specialization in physical chemistry in Kamarov State University at Russia. He has done his MS in chemistry with specialization in Solid State Chemistry in Camero State University at Russia. Articles, Carbon Nanotubes, Graphene Structures, Metal Oxide, Nanowires, by, by Aerosol and Substrate CVD Synthesis Methods. Kinetic and Mechanetic Investigations of Nanomaterial Growth, Applications of Electrically Conductive, Transparent, Flexible and Stretchable Carbon Nanotube Films in Electronics and Electrochemical Applications. He is a recipient of uh, several awards, a few for the Best Professor Award of Sarkoche Mentor, Gold Medal named after academician Pitiono for Outstanding as a Field of Physical Applied Chemistry, the Best Professor Award of Sarko Technology for Teaching Activities in 2019 and in the 2017. And he was a Best Professor of, uh, he was awarded a professor Professor of Russian Academy of Sciences in 2018. Dr. Hans in scientific journals including Nature Nanotechnology, Nature Communications, na na Nano Letters, ACS Nanos, Advanced Materials, Journal of American Chemical Society, Scientific Reports, Physics Review Letters, Nano Research, Small Chemistry of Materials and others. 33 patents applications have been filed on and co-authored of more than 260 unreferred publications and conference proceedings and abstracts. He has a Google Scholar of Hutch Index 54 and citations of level 1130. With this brief intro, may I now request Dr. Albert G. Nasibi to deliver a talk on carbon nanotubes. Sir, please. Thank you very much, Father, for so nice introduction. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
And uh, if you allow me to start my presentation with a question. So, so who doesn't have a mobile phone? I'm not expecting the question, otherwise it might take a lot of time, but it were face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, conference, probably I would, I would ask. And probably everyone has a mobile phone, but let me ask the next question is who has Nokia mobile phone? I believe very few or none of you would have a mobile a Nokia mobile phone. But at the same time, if you um, kind of go back to 2010, so the Forbes magazine was wondering, can anyone catch the cell phone king? So nobody could even believe that Nokia is going to disappear soon after a few years. There have been a few like a political reasons and, and also technological. And one of those, in my opinion, they did not put enough uh, effort to develop um, smartphones, namely um, the materials uh, which could be utilized for transparent conductors, like, uh, for example, carbon tubes. If they um, spend more time with this, probably uh, they could solve this problem. And uh, I will tell you today about single world carbon tube from synthesis to application based on my uh, own experience. So I worked 16 years in Finland and in 2014 I moved to Moscow uh, to the uh, Skolkov Institute of Science and Technology, we call it Skoltech. It's a, like a new model educational institution which was established quite recently, only in 2011, first English-speaking graduate university and so what is the most important for us is not only education, but also innovation and entrepreneurship. We are growing up a new generation of uh, students. So importantly to know that last year, 2019, our university nature index uh, was ranked number 97, so among uh, young universities. So today I will tell you uh, briefly about carbon tubes, about the synthesis and uh, their applications. So single word carbon tubes, how could we represent it? So nowadays, especially after the boom in graphene, everybody knows what graphene is. And you could make a carbon tubes if you roll a single uh, sheet of graphene into a cylinder, you are going to get a carbon tube with a different uh, chirality, depending what kind of piece of graphene you are going to take to make a cylinder. It might be metallic or it might be semiconducting carbon tube. Why carbon tubes are actually uh, so important and why, why we are discussing about them? We could say that the carbon tubes are champion among other materials according to their records uh, for physical chemical properties. So you could, you could see here, the so carbon tubes are better conductance than copper. So you can also utilize this material to make semiconducting um, devices. You could make a field effect transistors better than silicon. And I, I'm going to tell you about this today. So it is very highly uh, heat uh, conductive material, as good as diamond. And uh, you could make out of this material field effect transistor, uh, sorry, uh, cold emitters, uh, electron cold emitters. Uh, this material is very stable, up to 1500 centigrade, and you could compare it with different polymers, which uh, start to degrade at uh, the temperatures about 1000 cent 100 centigrade. It is very light material and 25 times stronger than steel. So it has a unique uh, properties. Uh, these properties possess and they help uh, to find uh, applications in practically in, in a different and many uh, uh, fields of, of science and technology. So we can take like electronics and photonics, functional and structural materials, medicine and energy. In practically any field, you would be able to find a niche where carbon tubes alone or together as a composite material might help to improve a certain uh, devices or certain applications. In electronics and photonics, for example, you could make uh, flexible 
transparent, stretchable field effect transistors, for example, light emitters, detectors, oscillators, and so on, so on, so on. So I'm not going to list all of them. I better show only those with which I've been working, and so you would understand the, how, the variety of application for carbon arm cube material. But of course, since the lecture is uh, in general about carbon arm cubes, you might be wondering, oh, how um, popular nowadays carbon arm cubes? Yeah, I was following till 2016, so after that, so I stopped um, looking at the number of publications because you can clearly see that uh, first, so starting from uh, actually 1991, after the landmark publication by Sumi and Ijima. So the interest to carbon ion tubes started to increase, and then at the maximum at about uh, 2014, we see a drop uh, in the interest to this field. However, if you look at the number of patterns, the situation isn't so bad, you don't see so drastic change. And moreover, if you look at the industry, and look how many companies are growing up nowadays and working, producing, synthesizing carbon ion tubes. Uh, we see that the average growth rate is about like 30%. And that could be easily understand from the hype of technology. In 1991, when Sumi Ejima published his uh, paper and attracted the research community to the carbon ion tube, we see a growth of interest to the field, which is explained by fundamental studies of the properties of carbon ion tubes. It may be about like 2014, people realized that there are some other materials and probably carbon ion tubes not immediately give you the results uh, which are needed. Uh, then we see like a drop in the interest. However, in the very future, hopefully we are already somewhere here, we'll see the uh, slope of enlightenment and then we'll come to the plateau of productivity. This interest is solely explained by the industrial interest to this material. If this is fundamental, this is industrial one. And uh, last year I was an opponent for uh, one of PhD dissertation by Oli Pitkinen. And so in his, um, in, in his uh, introduction, he wrote that carbon tubes are still important and still a growing interest. How he showed it, he selected two words to demonstrate, uh, two keywords, carbon tubes plus applications. Yes, you, you indeed see that the number of publications is growing. And very important that if you would like to justify your research, you would always be able to, to find like a, a way to do this. If you look at the uh, production of carbon ion tubes, nowadays uh, the multi-volt carbon ion tubes are mainly produced in China and Japan. It's uh, multi-volt carbon ion tubes and single-volt carbon ion tubes uh, nowadays mainly produced by uh, the company Oxia, which is located in Novosibirsk in Russia. So they were able to drop down the price for this material on three orders of magnitude. So if before, like four or five years ago, so for a couple of thousand dollars, you could buy one gram of this material. Nowadays, you can spend this amount of money and buy one kilogram, so which is a really a, a big uh, achievement in, in the production of, of this uh, nice material. Another important fact that almost third of the market of, of nanomaterial belongs to carbon ion tubes. Carbon ion tubes are really uh, important materials. So how are they synthesized, those tubes? I personally divide uh, all the method for, for the uh, carbon ion tube grows uh, according to carbon atomization, physical and chemical way. Physical way, way uh, is based on sublimation, desublimation of carbon. Since graphite, which is usually used for the synthesis of carbon ion tube, has a very low equilibrium vapor pressure, you need to put a very high energy uh, to evaporate this material, and it takes at temperatures above like three, five thousand Kelvin. Uh, that could be realized using arc discharge, uh, laser ablation, solar energy, or induction heating. There is another way, uh, the chemical, where you don't need such high temperatures, so 1000 centigrade is enough to produce a high quality uh, carbon ion tubes. 
Uh, this is based on decomposition of um, different carbon compounds like hydrocarbon, CO, or alcohol. So in turn, this method, one can divide into substrate CVD and aerosol uh, CVD synthesis. Substrate is based on the fact that you take an um, inert substrate, usually uh, alumina or silica, uh, on the surface of this material, you form catalyst particle, you put it in the reactor, which is about 800 to 1000 centigrade heated. You introduce carbon source, and after 20 minutes, you take it away and you enjoy your carbon tubes. The aerosol CVD or floating catalyst method, I would like to tell you about, is a little bit different. So it is more complicated, but at the same time allows to produce a very high uh, quality uh, carbon nanotubes. And that's going to be a topic of our um, uh, lecture today. So in um, the laboratory, we have realized a different way how the carbon nanotubes could be synthesized. The first one is a hot wire generator, for example. So where the catalyst is formed by evaporation from resistively heated wire, it is iron wire, you apply a potential, it is heated up close to melting temperature, about 1500 centigrade, and iron starts to evaporate. And you blow through the reactor flow, inner flow, which takes this vapor and then form catalyst particle and introduce it in the reactor. The other one is based on chemical uh, decomposition of the precursor. In this case, we utilize a ferrocene. Ferrocene is a metal organic compound. It contains an atom of iron needed uh, to, to make the catalyst particle. And this compound is volatile at room temperature. So this advantage we applied so that we fill a cartridge with this powder. It is powder at uh, ambient conditions. And pass through the powder carbon monoxide. So what happens is carbon monoxide saturates with a vapor of ferrocene, and then the vapor gas mixture is introduced directly into hot, hot temperature reactor, about 1000 centigrade. So what happens? Ferrocene decomposes, forms catalyst particles, two to five nanometers, which is needed for CO disproportionation reaction. So CO decomposes or disproportionate only on the surface of iron particles, not on the surface of, of the uh, walls. And that leads to the release of atomic carbon on the surface of catalyst particles and growth of carbon tubes. While the flow is moving from the entrance to the outlet, so we see the formation of catalyst particles, growth of carbon tubes, and they are collected downstream of the reactor just by filtering the, the whole flow. So this is a reactor. We introduce the needed species. At the outlet, it goes through the filter. Depending on the collection time, we see the carbon tube with different thickness. The numbers here in nanometers showing the thickness of carbon tubes. And from this, uh, film, we could transfer it to practically any other substrate. So we better show a movie. So you can see here a filter, which originally was A4 size. With the scissors, we cut the shape we would like to give. Then we press it against the substrate. In this case, in our case, it is a polydimethyl siloxane, PDMS. And you see that we form elastic electrode. But you could also transfer it to glass if you want, or if you would like to get a flexible uh, electrode, in that case, you transfer it to PET. So the process is very quick, it's very fast. The carbon tubes are high quality. You don't need uh, purify, and everything is ready for the, their utilization. How they look like in a scanning electron microscope and transmission electron microscope, you could a look at this slide. It is randomly oriented single walled carbon nanotubes uh, over high quality, practically no um, unused catalyst particles. There are some, some catalysts which is covered by amorphous carbon. And for many applications, for example, for optoelectronics, so th these particles do not harm at all. You don't see amorphous carbon, so basically the tubes are ready to be utilized in different applications. Their quality is confirmed by Raman measurements. So very strong G-band uh, telling us about the graphitic carbon and quite low intensity of D-mode 
uh, telling us about disordered carbon tells us about the quality. So high G to D ratio is a confirmation of high quality tubes. And then we see here radial breathing mode, which uh, the frequency uh, Raman shift is inversely proportional to the diameter. We see that the radial breathing mode, which is conforming with that we produce single walled carbon tubes, is also shifted to larger diameters. So basically playing with the temperature, we can vary also the diameters of carbon tubes. Raman uh, can see only a tiny fraction of tubes which are in resonance with the wavelengths. However, in order to be able to see all the tubes, we utilize UV visible mean infrared absorption spectrum. So here you could see uh, that such kind of electronic features, Fangor singularities, S11 and S22, this is semiconducting tube, and even in metallic carbon tubes, M11, can be easily seen. So that belongs to S11. Since we have a carbon tube with a, a range of diameters and, and of course, chiralities, we see like a distribution uh, of diameter. So this is S11, S22, and also metallic carbon tubes. Then we could easily see that the mean diameter of carbon tube is changing from about 1.1 to 1.7 nanometers. So with this method, we could cover the whole range from U UV visible, from UV to, to near infrared range, which is quite important for optical applications. So nowadays we, are quite actively using computer to help us, so-called artificial intelligence uh, in our life. We also would like to be in the streamline and uh, use different kind of uh, machine learning method to help us to synthesize carbon nanotubes. So as an example, we did with artificial neural network uh, using five parameters, the most important which affect the growth of carbon nanotubes, uh, which could predict uh, quite precisely uh, diameter, yield, and G to D ratio, which is telling us about the quality of carbon tubes. So this uh, actually uh, quite ni nicely realized, and nowadays, if we would like to get a certain carbon tube, a certain diameter uh, with a certain yield, so we uh, can backward come to, to, to the computer to predict other conditions for, for their synthesis. So, uh, applications. Now we are producing good quality carbon tube. What can we do and what for these uh, carbon tubes could be utilized? Uh, in the beginning we were inspired actually by uh, the electronics uh, development change. You could look at this like a set of mobile phones starting from 1981 and there is a drastic change in the view and their functionality. So we expect even more changes uh, if we would have the material which would be flexible, transparent, and elastic. So you would be able to bend it, you would be able to fold it, basically do actually whatever, and one cannot even predict how our life is going to change with our gadgets. It is becomes even more important with um, variable electronics, such kind of material Gives, would give us possibility to create the chips which would uh, allow us to monitor the heart rate, the body temperature, hydration rate, UV exposure, and, and um, basically tell us everything uh, about us. We really need to work on to, to develop such kind of materials. Let's look at the requirements to the materials for flexible and stretchable electronics. First of all, we need to fabricate this at room temperature because the plastic is, a, is a, like a typical substrate for that purpose. And plastic does not take more than 100 centigrade. Second, it should be low cost fabrication. It must be um, competitive uh, with existing technology. Preferably it should be done at atmospheric pressure with a high speed printing mat and uh, roll to roll compatible. In that case, we'll have uh, the um, conditions to, to successfully utilize carbon nanotubes. And the method I introduced you today, this aerosol uh, CVD method, really allows to, to fulfill all these requirements. But how about the currently uh, existing technology uh, or materials like silicon, uh, 
transparent conductive oxide like RTO, zinc oxide, um, and, and other, could they be utilized? Unfortunately, not. And there is a main uh, fundamental limitation, their physical properties. So this is a very good example uh, by uh, Professor Yang Hee Lin when he demonstrated the bending uh, angle really affect the conductivity of ITO. You could see here the ITO and this is sheet resistance. When you start to bend it, I, the sheet resistance goes up and if you uh, return it to the uh, zero degree, so you'll never get the initial value. Basically, you are breaking this electrode. While with carbon ion tubes, you can do whatever, practically nothing happens. And I also would like to show you an example which was obtained with our company, Kanato. Uh, they demonstrated, depending on the uh, substrate thickness, you could get a quite stable. Um, so you, you, if you notice here, they did like 150,000 times. Basically, it is like forever and, and could be utilized like forever. And you could see on a very thin substrate of 20. Uh, three micrometers, so the change is only 1%, which is uh, uh, expect, acceptable uh, by the industry. So the carbon ion tubes could be easily utilized for uh, flexible electronics. How about the conductivity? Then we need to look at the curve uh, like a transmitter and sheet resistance. So we would like to be uh, somewhere here at the transmittance of 90% in the middle of visible range, 550 nanometers. So we would like to have the material which uh, will be conducted like 10 ohm per square. That's the basically current ITO um, performance on rigid substrate. On a flexible substrate, we already beat uh, in 2011. I think we, we made a better one. Now we are fighting against ITO on rigid. And you can see here the our progress. Our last results were like a 17 ohm per square, which is already quite close or com comparable with uh, commercially existing uh, ITO on rigid substrates. Still, we could utilize machine learning uh, to improve the conductivity of our film. So I'm not going into detail, but if you analyze uh, the most important process which occurs during the growth of carbon nanotubes, the most important parameter, basically. So we came up that temperature and CO2 concentration affect the mostly the, the parameters of our tubes. And if you plot a map which showed the sheet resistance, depending on these two parameters, would give you uh, di di different numbers depending on the temperature and CO2 concentration. And you could see uh, the red points, they show high quality tubes, and the blue one, they show like uh, carbon ion tubes uh, which are not produced at the most optimum conditions. And uh, so how could we utilize the machine learning to predict the growth uh, conditions for our carbon ion tubes? First, we go to the ISO CVD reactor, synthesize, we get a map uh, distribution of, of uh, sheet resistances at different conditions. Then we utilize our support vector regression and uh, get a mapping now, from which you could easily get the extremum point, uh, the point where the sheet resistance would be minimal. Then we go to the uh, and then we, we get the conditions, okay, this temperature and this uh, CO2 concentration, we go for the verification to the reactor, synthesize the tubes, and we get like 39 ohm per square. So that period of time, it was a state of the art. So quite good results obtained with the machine learning technique. So our films uh, could be utilized for different applications. And here I would like just to show uh, in 2010, we, when we really produced it, uh, the films close to 100 ohm per square. So we collaborated with the University of Texas at Dallas. So they made uh, some OLEDs for us. They replaced ITO and we started to work with touch sensors. So where the carbon ion tube is a conductive but transparent layer. So this is only single picture, uh, single pixel. And our company, Kanato, uh, started to work with a mobile phone, actually with Nokia company. They were quite interesting to develop and they made like a first 80 mobile phones with a carbon ion tube where the performance of 
uh, films was uh, quite good. Uh, and one of the tests, so we, we had to actually pass, I just would like to tell you, is that um, after putting a mobile phone uh, to a sauna, say like 80 degrees C at the humidity of 80%, after constant working of three months, your, your device uh, cannot degrade. So you probably, if you remember that time, Nokia phones were unbreakable, so they were actually quite um, reliable um, uh, uh, gadgets. Well, uh, approximately that period of time, the Nokia was bought by Microsoft. They lost any kind of interest to develop this uh, technology. And uh, so Nokia uh, and, and our company, Kanatu, which name came actually from Carbon Nanotube, um, started to look their own niche uh, where, where to be developed. And since the gadget um, market was quite crowded, so they, they uh, went to the automobile industry. Let me show the movie. So the Kanato um, idea card is to make in a car every single surface work as a touch sensor so that you could uh, accurate your mobile, your, your car, so that touching different surfaces. Every single panel is can be a touch sensor. There are no any more like knobs that we usually get used to see, but only touching the fingers you, you could actually drive your car. And that's understandable because carbon and tubes could be transferred to practically any other substrate, plastic, textile, or laser if you want. So if you're interested, you could uh, visit uh, our um, website, canato.com, and there are like quite many other different applications uh, for carbon and heat in automobile industry. So i just uh, go further. What else can we do with uh, uh, transparent conductors? The one of the application is, of course, a solar cell. So it, it is like back to 2014 when we took N uh, doped silicon. So this is uh, silicon substrate, and when we put a carbon nanotube and P dope it. So then we get a PN junction. And when you irradiate with the sun, so this PN heterojunction basically uh, start to create uh, the photoelectricity and with an efficiency of uh, about like 10% and after six months, uh, which is quite stable and, and it works. So uh, that was done in collaboration with a uh, uh, Japanese uh, University of uh, Tokyo, uh, Maruyama Sensei. And in our laboratory, we started to work with uh, amorphous silicon. Basically, it is the same idea. We utilize amorphous silicon, but amorphous silicon allows us to produce flexible uh, solar cell. Uh, so Pramod Rajana, who got his PhD in this in May of this year, so he developed a new kind of electrode. It is quite complicated in structure on the basis uh, on single walled carbon ion cube. He added P dot PSS and also uh, molybdenum oxide and covered it uh, with a PMMA as an anti-reflective layer. And he also utilized carbon tube fibers as a current collector. So uh, he did a quite complicated structure, but he was able to get 8.8% .8 of efficiency. And you could see uh, we started to work in 2016 and our first paper was 1.5%, so then we improved to 3.4, and now it's 8.8, .8, which you need to compare with 7%. So if you finalize this um, solar cell with amorphous silicon uh, layer, not, not with our electrode, you, you get only 7%, so which is quite uh, a, a tremendous achievement for, for, for the uh, um, amorphous silicon substrate. Of course, when we talk about um, electronics, the core of electronics is field effect transistors. Transistors are really driving all our devices. And can we do uh, transistors out of single wall carbon nanotubes? Uh, imagine, usually the process of synthesis leads to uh, the production of sy synthesis of a mixture of metallic and semiconducting tubes. So in that case, between source and drain, 
you need to create um, quite sparse network where the uh, pathway would be through only semiconducting carbon nanotube. Not only, but there wouldn't be any per metallic percolation between source and drain. And that could be realized just by controlling the density of carbon nanotubes. You could deposit and make a bottom gate structure on the silicon substrate or top gate structure on the polymer. So here is an example of uh, the array of 49 transistors made on the PET substrate. And of course, whenever when we discuss about the transistors, so we need to remember what kind of mobility of charge carriers we get and on-off ratio. For an example, you could see here the um, performance of organic transistors and amorphous silicon and also polycrystalline silicon. Of course, our goal is to be somewhere here, or at least better than polycrystalline silicon. And our first result, 2011, we were able to get like a quite good uh, devices which uh, show the owner ratio 10 to 6, 10 to 7. However, the mobility of charges wasn't uh, so good. So that's why a few years later, we improved the process. We were able to make like a fully uh, single walled carbon nanotube transistor where, where even the source and drain was made of, of carbon nanotubes and, and gate also. And then we were able to get um, the uh, field effect transistors uh, processing uh, the performance close to, to polycrystalline silicon or even better in, in the mobility terms. So, that's one application, that's so-called uh, so like old uh, school uh, application. <laughs> How about the application in the future, say like in a uh, stretchable uh, electronics, <coughs> which does not exist yet, but we believe is going to happen soon. So carbon nanotubes could be utilized in the two different uh, applications, the same tubes, they could be strain sensitive, from one side. And on the other side, they could be stable in performance. So basically, when you strain, resistivity, resistance can change or it could uh, keep constant. How to do it? Very simple. So if you deposit the carbon nanotube from the uh, filter on a PDMS uh, substrate and start to stretch it like we did it here, you can see that here is the uh, intensity of light emitting diode is changing. So because the current goes through the carbon nanotube, when you stretch it, so what actually happens is that the resistance goes up and current goes down. That's why you see the change uh, in the intensity. Well, on the other side, you could see if we pre-stretch substrate first and then deposit carbon nanotubes, like shown here, we are going to get quite stable device. When you stretch it more than two times, so you do not see any change in the intensity uh, of, of the light emitting diet. So the same tube could be utilized as a, a strain sensitive and, and stable uh, electrode. So uh, therefore we could propose like a different application as an active component when you deposit them on a finger. So when you bend your finger, you see that the current changes, so it is highly sensitive device. At the same time, you could utilize it as a passive electrode, which is sometimes needed for, for certain applications. So the current goes through, but uh, it is quite stable. And to demonstrate uh, the advantages of this material, so we used ACG, uh, removed a copper electrode and put uh, our uh, electrode, which is based on hydrogel and, and carbon nanotubes, and you could see we were able to decrease the noise level uh, in such kind of devices because carbon nanotubes, they do not feel any change uh, in, in, the, um, in the strain uh, of this device. Quite important that carbon nanotubes could be utilized not only to make uh, films, but also you could make fibers. So how do we make fibers? Very easy. So this is a film with carbon nanotubes. Then you put a drop of ethanol or basically any liquid which will wet on the carbon nanotubes. And then with a tweezer, you could pull it off and then you create a fiber uh, with a um, uh, diameter of like 10 to like 100 uh, micrometers, depending on what kind of piece of, of uh, carbon nanotube film you are going to take. And what actually you could see here, 
the uh, fiber consists of randomly oriented single walled carbonyl tube, which gives tremendous sensitivity. So when we would like to make a, a sensitive materials, it could uh, feel like a different load. But what is more interesting to show, if you make an electrode and put it on the neck uh, area, so in, in that case with such kind of device, you could measure the heart rate, which is not a surprise, but you could also see the breathing cycles. So inhale and exhale, inhale and exhale. This is extremely sen sensitive uh, device. So you could utilize to make uh, flexible and transparent supercapacitors with a very high uh, specific uh, capacitance, almost like a 500 farad per gram. Or you could make even stretchable when you stretch 100%, so you change the, the uh, length like uh, two times, and there is no change in the uh, performance of, this, of the supercapacitor. Uh, quite one more interesting application I would like to tell you is a uh, ionic liquid gating. So it is uh, a little bit uh, complicated, not for chemists to understand, but I think uh, it, it would be easy to um, follow me if I just say this is carbon ion tubes, is like a working electrode, uh, and we put a potential against uh, like a pseudo. Uh, reference electrode silver and also we have a counter electrode gold. So what happens when we put um, the potential and in, uh, in the presence of ionic liquid? So you form a double electrical la layer around the electrode. So you surround them with, with a certain atoms which will affect the electronic structure. Basically, here you could see one of the um, ionic liquids we utilized. And when you apply a potential, what actually happens, the Fermi level is go, going down so that some of the transitions are not possible uh, in the carbon nanotubes. As you could see here, you could apply positive or negative potential. In that case, in case of positive, the Fermi level goes down. In case it, when you apply negative potential, it goes up. But what happens that the first transition, S11, disappears because the um, Fermi level is below the, um, um, uh, the level of vacancy uh, for, for the semiconducting carbon ion tubes. When you apply more, S22 disappears. So then it, the Fermi level goes even uh, like more down. So you could uh, utilize this to change the absorbance of carbon nanotubes. Absorbance, um, of, which is, uh, uh, can be defined uh, by uh, linear uh, absorbance or linear properties, but also nonlinear could be a change. I will show you this a bit later. So when you apply the voltage, you could see at 550, this uh, spectra is quite important for us. So we could uh, see them and make them more transparent. But what is also important, when you apply a potential, you change the conductivity. So that happens because the Fermi level uh, goes uh, down so much that the Schottky barrier between uh, metallic and semiconducting is not possible anymore. Therefore, you could get the equivalent sheet resistance calculated for 90% transmittance film, like uh, with uh, like 50 ohm per square. This is quite reversible electrode. You could uh, manipulate and you could decide wh whatever uh, position is the Fermi level you, you get and whatever optoelectronic properties you can get with your device. How could this be applied? To make uh, extremely fast uh, lasers. So if you take a fiber laser, this is erbium uh, laser, and polish one side to the core and deposit carbon tubes, then the carbon tubes could be used as a saturable absorber. And then again, if you create a three electrode cell by playing uh, applying a potential to carbon ion tubes, you would be able to change and, and get two different regimes. There's a mode locking uh, or cool switching. So the first regime gives you like a femtosecond pulses, the second one is a microsecond pulses. Therefore, applying a certain potential to the carbon ion tubes, you might change the regimes uh, of carbon ion tubes. This, this is a, like a single device and it's quite unique. Uh, for, for such kind of devices when you can really drive and operate with your laser. 
So just uh, last um, configuration I would like to show you is the fabrication of freestanding carbon tube films. So since the carbon tubes are collected on the filter, you can make them freestanding. This is the filter and that's uh, the substrate with an opening. So you basically press it against the substrate with an opening and you could make the film to become freestanding. In that case, it is quite dark. And you obtain, in this case, about like 80 nanometer thick uh, freestanding film, but you could uh, make even like down to a few tens of, of nanometers or even less than, than uh, 10 uh, nanometer freestanding film. Uh, what can you do out of it? As there are many actually applications, so I would like just to show one of those so-called uh, Selma acoustic generator. So you can see the method of fabrication, very similar to what you have seen just in the movie. This is a freestanding 10 nanometer uh, thick film. Then we put electrode, and then using MP3 player, we could uh, drive like any music. So this membrane now can produce audible sounds, which you can hear. And the mechanism of the formation of sound isn't so simple. You don't see any moving membrane in this case. The sound is created by very quick heating and cooling down uh, of the carbon nanotubes. That basically creates the, the sound. And moreover, what I'd like to say that such kind of loudspeaker isn't, doesn't have the best performance in audible range, but for uh, ultrasound at 100 kilohertz, we get like a state-of-the-art performance. So uh, when you compare with different materials, you, we see that single volt carbon tubes they, they produce this, the sound pressure above 100 decibel. So one more application for the carbon tubes I would like to show is uh, since the film we are producing, it's it's only like a few layers of, of carbon tubes. It has a zero mass. When you irradiate with a, with a Infrared, you might heat it up and the resistance will change. If you detect the change uh, of the resistance under irradiation, you get the device which is called bolometer. So we created here a bolometer, we studied the carbon nanotubes, but also those carbon nanotubes which were uh, irradiated with a plasma. And so that allowed us to produce like highly sensitive uh, which, yeah, material which, which work in a quite wide range and um, with, with a response time like an order of a few uh, milliseconds. Uh, so the carbon tubes could be also utilized to make surface plasmon excited uh, in a metal surfaces. So we made a holes as you sh shown here, depending uh, okay, one side of the device was, was like with the perforated with a hole, the other one was a pristine one. And if we irradiate this part with the infrared, so we are going to uh, get the surface plasmons, which uh, really affect the absorbance of the material. So we did first the calculation, of course, depending on the periodicity, uh, hole diameter and film thickness, we could find the areas where the carbon nanotube uh, will absorb uh, light. So here's an example of, of a bolometer which uh, basically works uh, and absorbs light at 15 uh, micrometers. So using uh, the, these meta surfaces. And uh, I hope I was able to prove you that the single wall carbon nanotubes produced by aerosol synthesis they show a high performance, they could be utilized in, in many uh, applications. I wasn't able to, to cover even all the applications we have been working. Since the technology is a low temperature, doesn't require any vacuum, it is very simple, fast process and, and low cost. I believe it has a really uh, great future uh, and could be utilized, uh, could be widely used uh, for the synthesis of carbon tubes in the nearest future. And so at the end, I would like to thank um, my collaborators from Alta University, 
my collaborators from uh, Kanato and, and other uh, universities. I'd like to acknowledge the um, uh, foundation for giving us money to do this research and I'd like to thank you for your attention and of course I, I thank the Laboratory of Nanomaterials at Skolko Institute of Science and Technology. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Hello, can you, can you hear me? So, uh, how should we proceed with the, with the questions? Uh, uh, excuse me, sir, one minute. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, there are questions, yeah, one minute. Uh, can I read them? Do, do I see the questions or would you like to them? Yeah, I will uh, uh, read out the questions, right? Shall I read out the questions one by one? Yeah, hello. So, uh, hello. I sorry, I don't see the questions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I am here to read out the questions one by one. Shall I read out the questions one by one to you? Uh -huh. Sir, am I audible? Say it again, sorry, I can hardly hear you what you say. Sir? Yes. Yeah, I am here to read out the questions. I will be putting one 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 by one the questions from the participants to you. Shall I? Okay. Yes. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The first question is that. Uh, Carbon, known, uh, carbon is known as a basic fundamental component of genetic materials in plant systems. How does this carbon nanotubes quantitatively regulated into the cells of biological cells? Biological cells, okay. The question came about the biological application of carbon nanotubes. Uh, actually, we also have started to work on, on this uh, application, namely, uh, the uh, carbon nanotubes, they possess the photoluminescent properties. When you infrared in a um, um, ultraviolet or in a visible range, so they emit light in the near infrared uh, range. So that's quite, uh, quite important, especially we could easily move to the second uh, transparency window in the infrared range. Um, for, for, for that purpose, so you need to disperse carbon nanotubes first, and then to uh, make like th them individual. So one of the application is RNA delivery. When you cover a certain RNA with the carbon nanotubes, so, and you deliver this to the cell, you would be able to see the, the delivered um, species because they possess um, photoluminescent properties. So I did not show it because we're just only in the beginning of this uh, study. Yeah. So was, uh, was the next it? question is that what is the status of what is the status of what? Sorry. Yeah. What is the status of uh, nanotechnology applications in agriculture? Where? Sorry. Vehicle. What is the status of nan? Yeah. What is the status of nanotechnology applications in agriculture? Ah, oh, 
So uh, I don't want to say in general about nanotechnology. Of course, the nanotechnology um, uh, affects uh, quite much. I think agriculture is the most affected by uh, technology development area field. Uh, but if you say about carbon nanotubes, so there, there have been uh, a lot of studies where the uh, carbon nanotubes added to soil, for example, uh, really affected the uh, production rate like of different agricultural uh, things. And uh, yes, uh, the, the people are trying to utilize carbon nanotubes not only like in electronics, but also for, for the agriculture. Whether it is uh, already in the market, yeah. so I, I really doubt, but um, it is just growing field, I believe. Yeah. Uh, the next question is that can we use nanotubes in catalyzing the chemical reaction like an enzymes? Unfortunately, as far as I know, carbon nanotubes, uh, when they are very pure, they do not catalyze actually reactions. We have been trying like many electrochemical reactions. Uh, you cannot really make any reaction to, to go faster. You could utilize carbon nanotube as a support. Yes, in that case, uh, it really works. So as a support. Uh, the second you could introduce a certain defects. For example, there is a, like a hydrogen evolution reaction or oxygen reduction reaction uh, in, in uh, electrochemistry, electrocatalysis, which are quite important and could be, um, you could use uh, carbon nanotubes, but in that case, you cannot utilize pure carbon nanotubes. You need to dope them with uh, uh, like foreign uh, atoms, for example, with uh, nitrogen and nitrogen will give introduced in the um, carbon nanotubes will catalyze uh, oxygen uh, reduction reaction. As for enzyme, sorry, I I'm not aware and I don't know whether it's possible at all. I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, shall pass on to the next question. The next question is that. The usage of carbon nanotubes are helpful since it is used in different areas to innovate things. But he would like to ask that, uh, is there anything uh, downside to uh, in using carbon nanotubes? Is safe what it is? Is there is, uh, anything to worry about carbon nanotube? Is that the question? Yeah, downside, uh, what is the uh, 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 demerit of using the carbon nanotubes? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So are you, t you talking about, because the sound is like so sometimes disappear. I, I couldn't hear like a few words you said. Could you say it again, the last sentence? Oh, could you show me the question? Probably I better yeah. read it by uh, if you put them in the chat. Yeah, that would be fine, but uh, Yeah, the connection is really bad, so I see like you, you disappear. Yeah, so for example, if we are talking about the advantages and disadvantages, advantages I already showed you, they might be utilized in, in different many applications. So the carbon on tubes is a great material. It, it, it has a good like physical chemical properties. But for example, for utilization on, on, in biology and in medicine, we really need to prove that they do not damage. Their uh, cytotoxicity is uh, still under a huge question. And um, that's basically quite understandable uh, because the carbon nanotubes could be uh, could have with a, with a different like a parameters. Say multi volt carbon nanotube with a diameter of 50 nanometers and single volt with a diameter of one nanometer. How can you compare these two material? So it is 
they are more carbon nanotubes, but they are different. And I remember, like in 2005, there was a boom about the, um, uh, by Pauling. So he wrote a, a paper in uh, Nature uh, Nanotechnology. He wrote about that carbon nanotubes might possess asbestos effect. So he uh, considered only multi-volt carbon nanotubes uh, were quite large diameter and, and quite long. Maybe those can be, but a single volt carbon nanotube with a diameter of only one, two uh, nanometers will never uh, have this effect. So to tell anything about them, uh, like a uh, problem, we, what we need to do is to make a standardization of the carbon nanotubes. So you, you first uh, define the diameter, the length, the content of catalyst particles or, or impurities, and after, only after that you, you could really uh, give some assessment whether the carbon nanotubes of this certain particular purity and, and standard uh, are harmful or good for, for the health, possess or any kind of like toxicity. Yeah. Uh, the next question is that, is there any traditional method or old method to prepare nanotubes with the minimum cost? With the minimum cost, minimal cost. I think for multi-volt carbon nanotubes, this is the way how you would like to produce like tones. It's a fluidized bed reactor is probably the best um, means to, to produce uh, like tons of carbon nanotubes. So when you make a catalyst on a support, you put it in the, in the uh, fluidized bed. So they just uh, staying in the reactor, you wait like maybe 20 minutes. And after that, uh, you collect the sample, you put a new uh, catalyst with a support. And then so you could r really uh, produce it quite many and the uh, yield of carbon nanotubes is, is quite huge. So when we are talking about multi-volt carbon nanotubes, single-volt carbon nanotubes also uh, could be produced in tons as was demonstrated by Oxial company. But we can only guess what is the synthesis method because it's a top secret. They are hiding it. Nobody actually knows. And uh, probably... Uh, as they demonstrated, they can produce like 10 tons per year. Now they build a new reactor, which allows to make 50 tons per year. I believe it's possible, but how they really synthesize this tube, single water, I cannot say. multi volt carbon nanotubes could be easily produced in tons uh, scale. Yeah. The next question is that, can we use carbon nanotubes to cure cancer and allergy? Uh, sorry, I'm not a specialist in biology. I, I wouldn't be able to give you the answer. Okay, so the next question is that. Uh, the next question is that what happens to the elasticity of the carbon nanotubes if a strong force is applied on it? Will it changes its shape and or retains its originality? Uh, what happens when we apply a mechanical force to carbon nanotube? Is that the question? By other words. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is the carbon nanotubes. It's one of the strongest materials. So it's de definitely they can uh, survive like very uh, large mechanical uh, actually force. Uh, the, I have shown actually a few examples uh, how the carbon nanotubes uh, could be utilized for stretchable electronics. Uh, it is a carbon nanotube film. Uh, of course, there is a restructuring uh, of carbon nanotubes on the surface. They are not broken for the films, but they are just sliding along uh, each other. Uh, in case if you start to like uh, apply a mechanical uh, strength to a single tube, of course, you can break it at, at, at a certain point. So that definitely happens with the, any, any material, even with the strongest in the world. Yeah. 
the next question is that among the applications you have listed in your le lecture uh, which would be the best application ever using this carbon nanotube tubes as per your opinion mm it's a good question basically as i already explained in any field you could uh, uh find a certain niche for the carbon nanotubes in my opinion like transparent conductors that's probably my lecture was about is probably the uh one of the application where carbon nanotubes could really uh, beat ito and especially in in the mechanical properties so you could make a a highly flexible and uh, stretchable uh, transparent conductors. I think carbon nanotubes is the only material which could be utilized for this purpose. Yeah, the next question is that, how can we transfer carbon nanotube link to glasses? Um, if they are synthesized by, by the, the technique, what I introduced, uh, basically, uh, what do you do? I, 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 can you see the movie now? I'm showing. Yeah. So, we synthesize carbon nanotubes, collect them on a filter. Then we press it against any substrate. Could be glass, could be PDMS in, th in this case, or it could be <coughs> uh, actually any other material. And you could see that um, the um, transferring process is very simple and, and very fast. <coughs> what is the answer yeah. to the question? Yeah, the next question. Yeah. Uh, the next question is that will the elasticity of a carbon nanotubes changes with its sensitivity? I did not get the last question, the last words. Could you repeat? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Will the elasticity of the carbon nanotubes changes uh, with its sensitivity? Sensitivity. Um, sensitivity as a mechanical, uh, for mechanical strain, or so what kind of sensitivity? Probably it is. Uh, they yeah. just they have mentioned the sensitivity. Yeah, sensitivity probably is um, in in the uh, transparent conductor uh, applications, where the yeah basically depending on uh, how so yeah depending on how we make it as I already told. You could get like a two condition when it is very sensitive and uh, it is non sensitive at all. Uh, yeah, and the sensitivity, uh, you, which is usually measured for uh, stretchable, uh, for strain sensor, is like a gauche factor, which is um, change of uh, electrical properties over change of geometrical uh, dimensions. Uh, for gauche factor for such, such kind of material is quite high. It is like 12, 16, when you would like to have them uh, quite sensitive. Uh, in case when they are not, you don't want to have them sensitive. So then the gauche factor is like close to one practically that does not re react on, on the uh, strain. Yeah. Uh, the next question is that what is the best way to confirm the growth of carbon nanotubes using SIM? Uh, what is what is what? Sorry, I missed the word. Yeah. Can you repeat? The best. What is the best? Yeah. What is the best way to confirm the growth of carbon nanotubes using SIM? That is scanning electron microscope. Actually, scanning electron microscope, uh, uh, yeah, scanning SEM, I understand what is the best way. SEM is, is usually used 
And you could basically, if you're growing them on a substrate, you could always confirm whether you produced scanning electron microscope with a scanning electron microscope on a substrate, say on silica uh, or not. Uh, when you grow individual ones, uh, in some, uh, the individual tubes started to glow, even though their diameter only like one to two nanometers, you can clearly see them with a scanning electron microscope. Unfortunately, alone, SAM isn't enough to um, characterize the tube. So usually um, you should uh, apply Raman to, to prove that they are single walled carbon tubes, or you better uh, utilize the transmission electron microscope where you could definitely characterize uh, your tubes. Say not only how many walls and their diameter, but you could also do electron diffraction and tell about the chirality of the carbon tube. SAM is a, a very good device, uh, a pro good, good approach, but is not enough alone uh, to characterize carbon tubes. The next question is that how, how can the band gap of uh, carbon nanotubes can be turned? Yes, it's a very good question. Uh, in reality, the band gap of uh, semiconducting carbon ion tubes is uh, almost like inversely proportional to the diameter. So you uh, need to control the diameter of carbon ion tubes. But anyway, what you're going to get is a distribution of diameters, which means distribution of band gaps. Uh, if you would like to uh, have a carbon ion tube with a certain um, band gaps and you need to produce carbon ion tube with a certain chirality, which is unfortunately at the moment is not possible. Many, many people are trying, like, like heading, uh, to solve this problem. However, it uh, hasn't been uh, solved yet completely. Uh, what you could do, you could separate carbon ion tubes by um, using like a gel chromatography. Uh, if you disperse carbon ion tube, you, you could separate carbon ion tube with different chiralities. Th that is like a more difficult process. It's not one step. Of course, it takes some uh, time additional, but then you could get carbon ion tube with a certain chiralities and cer a certain uh, band gap. Yeah, next question, please. The next question is that, yeah, uh, the factors of the what are the factors to control single walled carbon nanotubes over multi walled carbon nanotubes formation? Yeah, the, it's also a very good question. So, if you would like to grow single walled carbon nanotubes, you need uh, to make the uh, catalyst particle need to control the catalyst particle size. It's usually two to five nanometers in this range. So you could produce single walled carbon ion tubes. For multi walled of course, the diameter should be larger. It is also important that even for such kind of small catalyst particle like five nanometers, you can grow, grow double and triple walled carbon ion tubes. Uh, it is also uh, very effective uh, by uh, control of uh, the hydrocarbon or, or like a carbon source. So if the feed rate of carbon into catalyst particles is very fast, you may end up with the growing of uh, multi volt or say double, triple volt carbon ion tube. If you control it, so you, your feed rate uh, of the carbon in the catalyst particle, so you, you grow with um, only single volt carbon ion tubes. There is one kind of um, carbon source as a carbon monoxide, CO. Whatever you do with it, you can grow only single volt carbon ion tubes. So the secret is CO uh, disproportionation uh, needs like a two atoms of, of carbon to disproportionate. That's why the uh, grow feed rate of carbon into catalyst cannot be high. So that's why it works and, and uh, uh, usually utilized to, to grow high quality single walled carbon ion tubes. Yeah, next yeah. question, please. The next question is that yeah. uh, what is the cost of producing of one gram of uh, carbon nanotubes? Uh, it depends. Um, multi walled carbon ion tubes <clears throat> nowadays could be uh, bought for 
20 to like 50 uh, euros or like dollars per, per kilogram. So the companies uh, are producing and, and you could buy single walled carbon tubes, as I told, like Oxial company, they are selling it two, three thousand euros. You could, or, or dollars, uh, you, you could buy one kilogram for multi walled carbon tubes. That is the current like a status uh, for the um, price of, of, of the tubes. Yeah. Uh, the next question is that, uh, is it possible to synthesize carbon nanotubes using physical vapor deposition techniques? Physical vapor deposition, it uh, depends for what is a physical vapor deposition. So first of all, you need to provide uh, the factors which you need uh, when you grow carbon nanotubes as a full. You need to provide like a high temperature above 400 centigrade. So at low temperatures, only with a plasma enhanced CVD, you can grow carbon nanotube. Usually to grow a high quality tubes, you need like 800 to 1000. Uh, with a PVD, uh, you could basically um, um, uh, create the catalyst particle, uh, but uh, a lone PVD wouldn't be able to, to, to allow you to synthesize carbon nanotubes. Maybe you would be able to make like a catalyst particle, so like pre, pre uh, uh, stage, but not the, the growth itself. Yeah, the next question is that can we use sole gel uh, process to produce multi-walled carbon nanotubes? Sole gel process is widely utilized to make uh, catalyst particles. For example, with a microwave assisted sole gel process, you could make nickel particles or cobalt particles, and then you, you with a spin coating, you, you could cover to the substrate, say, say silica, silicon substrate, and then you put it in the reactor and grow. Yes, yeah, sole gel process, itself wouldn't allow you to produce carbon nanotubes, but, but uh, it could be used to, to make a catalyst particle for, for the synthesis of carbon nanotubes. Yeah, the last question before you leave is that, can we create a microscopic camera to visualize microscopic things easily in the future? Uh, microscope? To visualize. Actually, if I had more time, I probably could show you in situ studies how the carbon nanotubes grow. Basically, Helvec um, in already um, uh, like so long time ago, like almost 10 years ago, he was the first one to show the growth of carbon nanotubes directly in a transmission electron microscope. It is so called environmental term. So, which allows you to see the catalyst particle, how the nucleation start and how it grows. So, basically, the, the TEM and SEM has been already quite widely used to investigate uh, both single walled and multi walled carbon nanotubes for, for the growth of carbon nanotubes. It's been done, and so it was the first evidence uh, to see really how the carbon nanotubes are growing. Sir, uh, some of our participants are uh, very interested in doing their PhD in your laboratory and uh, are, uh, they are asking that are there any vacancies available to carry out their research or there in the laboratory and uh, what are the eligibility criteria for Indians to apply in your research laboratory? Yeah, so I then would like to advertise a little bit. Our school tech, uh, school Institute of science and technology are ex accepting students uh, from uh, all over the world, like uh, Pramod Rajana, he was my uh, first uh, PhD from India, uh, so he, here in, in Russia, um, and everybody can apply, but uh, the study starts in November, so now uh, in, in a two weeks we are expecting those who was uh, taken to our university during summertime. So basically now it is too late for the next year, but uh, the process of um, admission, I think starts in March probably. You just could go to scoltech.ru, scoltech.ru and, and find the admission of PhD student. You need to apply, you need to 
uh, put me if you would like to apply to me as, as a uh, as a potential supervisor and th there would be a, a committee who, who will so you will be interviewed you will be checked and in case if you are successful so you will be taken to the program it's possible you just go to scoltech.ru and check the admission rules so everything is written there yeah uh, thank you so much sir uh, for your presentation uh, and for your answering and your presentation was quite interesting and so informative it proves that you are knowledge passionate in the field of nano science and nanotechnology uh, and uh, i thank uh, there were a huge number of participants uh, throughout your talk and and their question was also so quite interesting and i thank you for you for your patience and your time in listening all of their questions and answering all your all their questions as well uh, I hope all participants are satisfied with our speaker's elaborate explanation and answering all your questions, sir. Thank you so much for the participants. And I also thank our speaker, Dr. Halbert Jean Asblin, of today's talk for spending your valuable time with us and extend my sincere gratitude to you on behalf of my entire team of Biomix. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.